So Vincent Chin died 35 years ago, June 23rd. Is a sense of Asian America dying out today? I talked to Professor Karthik Ramakrishnan on today's show. Also, for Father's Day, I read from the original essay from my book, Amok. That and more on Emil Amok's Takeout. Hi, everyone, and welcome to what I call Emil Amok's Takeout. Now, normally we have our music, and, you know, I'm Catholic, and I, I just figure that uh, you know, like like during Lent when they stopped playing the, the, the music and they put shrouds over all the monuments. And I just feel like, um, you know, coming up to Vincent Chin's 35th anniversary, I feel a little more somber than normal. So uh, we'll just do it without music. We'll do it dry. But basically, it's still a meal amongst takeout. We serve it. You take it out. You know, it forms the acronym EAT, E-A-T, and it is time to eat. It's my takes on all things about race, society, politics, diversity, and everything those things touch in our culture and society with respect to Asian Americans. And you don't have to be Asian American, of course, to lend us your ears. Uh, we give it back. Uh, but we want your minds. It's, it's your minds we want. Uh, I'm Emil Guillermo, your host, and you might say, why amok? Well, the short story is that for nearly 15 years, my Emil Amok column was a staple of Asian Week, what was once the leading Asian American weekly in English in America. Amok was the name of my compilation of essays, and amok is on my driver's license, not indicative of my mental state. And, and it's also the name of my solo show. You know, I had a, a run-through at the Marsh in San Francisco, a little excerpt. And the Amok monologues, I think, are ready. I, they're, they're coming. It's a premiere is at the San Diego International Fringe Festival, June 23rd through 28th. It's coming up. So check out my site at www.amok.com for ticket information. It would be great to see you. I, it's me. I go on stage. I bang a gong. I talk about my father. It's fun. Now, this whole program, Emil Amok's Takeout, is based on the column that I did that continues on in various forms, but most notably on the website of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund blog. That's at aldef.org slash blog. That's A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. And you should uh, check it out if, if you like what you see and hear. ALDEF is a 501c3. You can go to the donate button and it's tax deductible. I also do a column for the inquirer.net, which is a website for the, the largest Philippine uh, newspaper in Manila, the uh, Philippine Inquirer. Uh, but it has a global audience because Filipinos uh, through the diaspora are far flung all over, all over the world. Uh, mostly in America, but you'll find them all over the world. And you can read my columns that are more Filipino-centric at theinquirer.net. Now, on this episode, I talked to Karthik Ramakrishnan. He's the public policy professor and dean at the UC Riverside School of Public Policy, and he's head of the organization AAPI Data. Now, you'll recall the insight that he collected for the National Asian American Survey 2016 with Jennifer Lee and a few other associates. Um, we talked about it the last episode. We got Karthik this time, and he tells us why it's significant. And I, I just want to go straight to him and uh, to hear him talk about the significance of the data. You know, usually at this time, I, I give my take on all the news and the news is actually pretty somber. You know, Trump continues to tweet us to death. And there was a shooter in Alexandria uh, the same day, you know, at the, the congressional baseball practice, which put us all in that same team mode. We were all talking about, oh, we're in the same team. And we had that moment of solidarity, which is great because that moment of solidarity, solidarity, you often feel like it times like inaugurals, like the Obama, the first Obama inaugural, I had a sense of that, that solidarity. And then, and then it vanished, right? For the next, for the next eight years. I don't know if we got that sense of solidarity, this last inaugural for Trump. I don't, I don't think it was like the first Obama inaugural, but definitely at the baseball game or well, at the baseball game and after that shooting we had, it, and then soon after, you know, it dissipates again. So 
You know, one of the ironic things is that the the shooting in Alexandria coincided with a shooting out here in uh, in California at the UPS facility. And one thing that was striking was how in Alexandria it was pretty much um, you didn't get a sense of diversity. Maybe diversity of opinion. We had a, a shooter who supposedly uh, was a an anti Trump guy who was uh, out there firing away uh, at at the Republicans who were, pra- who were practicing. But here in, in California, a totally different thing. There was an Asian shooter. There were Asian victims. It shows you that gun violence affects us all. And, you know, it was a moment to, to, to really talk about that. But I find that we have so many of these instances now and we have, I, have we become inured to this? I, I don't know. I, I just feel like I, I, you know, for the one of the first times after a, a moment of this kind of gun madness, I did not tweet. I don't think I tweeted at all. I don't think I commented at all. And I think maybe it's just this feeling that we're under this barrage constantly now from Trump's tweets, which, you know, it's, it's kind of like we, we're constantly under siege on this one, on this one level that when something happens like, you know, the gun madness we saw, it's almost like we're just too stunned to, to talk or too stunned to respond or we've gotten used to it. I, I don't know which, but it's, I just thought it was worth noting, you know, that these two things happen on the same day. And of course, the victims and the perp, Asian in California, which should make us stop and think about how we're we're not immune. Asian Americans are not immune to this, certainly. And I don't know what what we should think about this. Really, I mean, because I was talking, remember I was talking with David O, the Chinese, uh, or rather the Korean-American city councilman in Philadelphia, and he was commenting on the Chinese takeouts and how the Chinese were were arming up, right? They, they were, they saw that their way to defend themselves against robberies at the Chinese takeouts were by arming up. And it's no different from, say, the the Korean grocers in L.A. a generation ago when they were under siege. But who was out there? I I I didn't hear very many voices in the Asian American community coming out and uh, saying anything about either instance. You know what happened in Congress or or at the the congressional practice baseball practice or what happened at the UPS facility. It's just that. Maybe we know what the answer is, and we just haven't, as a society, decided to move forward on that, which is a sad thing. If there's something good about what happened in the congressional, at the congressional shooting, is that, uh, you know, the fact that it was baseball, it was a team thing, we, for a moment, got to think that maybe we could come together that maybe we were on the same team. And certainly you heard that from Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi immediately after when they spoke before Congress. And like I said, it just didn't last after the game. You know, one thing that happened to show the power of sports this past week, the Warriors had the parade. And the Warriors won in five, like I said, although, you know, I wavered and I said, I got greedy. I said, okay, they'd win in four, not five, but they won in, in five in a, a tremendous game. I, I actually was doing my, my one-man show and I couldn't see them beat the, the Cavs, but uh, I caught it on TiVo. I, I, it was a satisfying win. And I, I think maybe we're coming to a different sense of, you know how people think that sports is all about greed and money. And now if they want to keep that team together, they've got to think about sacrifice or think about what, they have to do to make it work, to make it happen so that Durant and Curry and Draymond Green and 
and Igadala and and all the backups like uh, Livingston can 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 stay together. I, I I didn't fail to mention Clay Thompson. He's an important part, but he's signed up. So maybe what we're seeing is a moment where the capitalistic greed that has really become one of the more distasteful things in sports is upended because the players realize there is a point besides uh, self-aggrandizement and, you know, self-enrichment, you know, or, you know, the, the, the whole capitalistic enterprise of the thing that there is still a joy in playing the game to excel, to become a champion. And the price is we approach sports, sports in this new way, not, not in this way where, Hey, I'm a free agent. I'm going to get all the money I can, which, Hey, we're talking about 30 to $36 million a year. I'm that significant dough, right? <laughs> I mean, and really, if you take, if I'm going to cut, come down from 36 million to 32 million, is it that significant? I mean, come on, you pro athletes, you elite pro athletes, and maybe they'll, they'll be the leaders to show that, Hey, if we want to be on the same team, we, we can, we can take some hits. We can take a $4 million hit. Anyway, congratulations to the Warriors. They are, they've always been my team. And, uh, you know, I'm not a Johnny come lately when it comes to the Warriors, when the Warriors were playing, when they won their first championship in 1975, I was a, uh, I was at, in college and I, in Boston yet, you know, where the Celtics were, you know, everyone's a Celtics fan. And I swear, I went, I went on every talk radio program as a caller just to, to sing praises for the Warriors, the first championship that they, that they ever had. I mean, the Warriors beating the Bullets, the, the Washington Bullets for, for nothing, straight set. I mean, a sweep. Rick Barry leading the way. I mean, I was just so, I mean, I was a Warrior fan back then, 75, but it's because I went to the first Warrior games in the 60s as a kid when they played at Civic Auditorium, now Bill Graham Auditorium. Hard to imagine because it's only 3,000 people capacity, and now they use it for high school graduations. But the Warriors were... I mean, they were an odd team. They had Wilt Chamberlain and they couldn't win. Um, They had, and then they had Rick Barry and they couldn't win. He went away to the ABA. And so look, I know about being a long suffering Warriors fan. 75 was a key. A couple of years ago was an even bigger moment, but now we have the legitimate dynasty occurring. And I have to admit, it feels good. And, you know, if you were to go to the games or go to the, see the parade and see the people and see all the Asian Americans, you know, not just Filipino Americans, but Chinese Americans, all sorts of Asian Americans, the whole broad section of Asian Americans, it's, it's just incredible to see that, see the, see them back the Warriors. And, and you can say, well, maybe you'd get some dispute for uh, from L.A. fans or for uh, people who remember the 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 you know the Jeremy Lin, his his Knicks days or I don't know where is he now. I I just think that you got to say that the Warriors are kind of kind of Asian America's team in a way. If you dispute that, then uh, send me an email. And say, oh no, Emil, the Asian American team of the NBA is all the Yao Ming teams of the Rockets. I don't know. I just I just have that feeling. So I've gone on and on about the Warriors. And now it's time to talk about since um, we'll segue into diversity and segue into um Karthik. Because his findings about Asian America. And about how, you know, you would think, you ask people who's an Asian American, and of course, blacks and Hispanics and and whites might have this opinion that some people are Asian American and some aren't, like Chinese and Japanese are, 
Filipinos maybe in the middle, but South Asians, maybe not. Bangladesh, Bangladeshis, maybe not. People with turbans, the Sikhs, maybe not. Which is which was the case in his findings, which was alarming. But then he posed the question to Asian Americans, and there was a similar kind of divide that some Asian Americans, specifically East Asians, didn't think that some South Asians were Asians. It's worth talking again. Here's my interview with Karthik Ramakrishnan of AAPI Data, public policy professor at UC Riverside. And, and coming up afterwards, I'll, I will give my, uh, I'll do my Father's Day essay. But let's go with Karthik. He, he talks about the census. He talks about how he got to the question. It's a wide-ranging interview. And I hope you enjoy it. Here's uh, me talking with Karthik Ramakrishnan of AAPI Data. The research in the National Asian American Survey that you conducted last year, especially on the question of who is Asian, in my mind was pretty jaw dropping. You know, South Asians not considered to be Asians by whites and even more so by East Asians. And so I, I just wanted to, to begin by asking what made you consider this as a, a question that was worthy of the survey in the first place? What did you see or sense? You know, one thing I should note, and this might seem like a minor detail, but, you know, South Asians are considered to be Asian. They're just much, they're less likely to be so. So a majority still think of them as, at least the plurality, depending on the group, think of them as Asian. It's just the proportion saying that they're not likely to be Asian or who have doubts is much higher among South Asians. Um, okay. So what motivated this? So uh, a few things. I mean, I, I should say I self-identify as South Asian, as Asian American, as Indian American, as Tamil, which is one of the language groups in India. Um, you know, we, we have all sorts of identities, but when it comes to ethnicity and race, we can think of these as nested identities, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't see any conflict between me saying that I'm South Asian or that I'm Indian, Indian or Indian American. Um, although, you know, in the U S it's funny just saying that you're Indian here, um, right. and Harry Kondabalu has, has been much more eloquent and funny on this than me, but essentially blame Columbus for the fact that, you know, yeah. we need to explain who Indians are. Right. Right. Well, <laughs> so, I, and, and that is a tricky um, thing. What, what do you, what do you prefer? Do you prefer South, South Asian Indian or Asian Indian? You know, it's, uh, it's funny, like to me now seeing Asian Indian, I don't even think twice about it because that's what the census category reports out. And I'm a nerd, right? I'm a demographer. I'm used to seeing this for so long that I don't, I don't blink. But when I've talked about it or when I use that word in other contexts, friends of mine or even colleagues on Facebook say, you know, why do you use the word Asian Indian? It's so artificial sounding, right? Or it's problematic to say Asian Indian. Why don't you just say Indian? It's like, well... Because the Census Bureau also put up, puts out information about American Indians or in, or in common parlance, depending, depending on where you're in the country. When you say Indian, you're not sure if people are thinking about Native Americans or, uh, or South Asians. Uh, the, uh, the idea is you, you are what you say you are. That's what the census goes by. What is the common way in the street that, that people would refer to each other by, by and large. And as a demographer, what do you find that they, they use or that they gravitate to? It, you know, so when we've, we've been serving this question for a long time, since 2008, um, you know, the extent to which people would identify with different labels like Indian or Indian American or Asian or Asian American. I don't think we've asked about South Asian per se. Um, but so from the survey data, we know that People ident identify with their country of origin and right. most likely to say Indian or Indian American in my instance, right? Uh, okay. and, right? And so we find that in the survey data, it also rings true with my experiences. Um, I should note that I'm, a, I'm an immigrant myself, so I'm what you call a 1.5 generation immigrant. Uh, so I lived in India till I was uh, 10 years old. Essentially, if you immigrated to the United States before high school, generally speaking, people would call you a 1.5 generation, um, meaning that first generation immigrant are those who are, who are foreign born. Uh, second generation are those born in the U.S. with uh, foreign born parents. People mm -hmm. like me are kind of in that halfway where we, 
remember enough about our home country and those experiences, right. but we tend to assimilate or incorporate very quickly. Right. So I don't have, I don't have an Indian accent, for example, you know, so. Right. Um, so you're a 1.5, one and a half and me being born to immigrant parents would be a, a two, mm -hmm. but having gone to an Ivy league college, I consider myself a two and a half. <laughs> You're like a super American. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's a half. Sometimes it's only a quarter, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's fun. It's interesting what different aspects of our identities can come into play, right, when it comes to to showing your credentials, as it were, right? Either formal credentials or even informally in terms of what people expect um, out of you. Well, th yeah. th that's what the meritocracy is about, right? That's what uh, <laughs> Richard Reeves was talking about, right? In the yeah. New York Times the other day. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, no, it's it's interesting. I mean, for me, uh, so did you grow up in the in the East Coast, Emil? San Francisco, the city proper, seven San by Francisco. seven, right there. And then, and now I live in exile. I'm in San Francisco in exile. I, I look <laughs> from afar, but I'm close enough. I'm close enough. But but you know, my my parents uh, immigrated to uh, the United States. They they landed in San Francisco, stayed there. They never went mm. east of Reno until I dragged them mm. to, to Harvard for my gra graduation. And mm. so, I mean, I, I mean, I, I always thought of myself as the second generation, but I wasn't sure. Well, yeah, cause my parents were the immigrant. If you count them as sort of one or zero, right. I could be either. Yeah. So this is part of the, yeah, this is kind of interesting when you look at the terminology and if you look at terminology, you know, what the experts do and what what is popularly understood aren't always mm -hmm. in line. Uh, but now I think slowly popular conceptions are changing. So a lot of people would say I'm first generation, meaning I am first generation born right. in the U.S., right? I'm a first generation Asian American. But what demographers and sociologists did decades ago is to call people first generation immigrant and then second generation immigrant or second generation. And that's because, you know, you if you call people born here first generation, then what does it make the immigrants zero generation? Like they're not really American, right? Yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, you, you, you or you, you make them the immigrant and then you start with the, right. you know, the, the birth, uh, you know, in, in America, the, uh, uh, the citizen or the, right. I, I don't know. But it sets up, yeah, but it sets this, yeah. But that's, I think, I don't think this was the reason this happened. Maybe it was, but it sets up this very problematic dichotomy between immigrant and right. American, right? right? That somehow you're not an American until you're born here. <laughs> so, well, well, but you know, that, that is something that I've noticed in polls and in, you know, opinion polls about uh, Asian Americans, this idea of foreign born versus native born. It's a very, I, I think it's a real thing. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a huge, no, of course. No, no. For, nativity mm. matters, right? Foreign born versus native born matters a huge deal. Also, by the way, foreign born, if you're talking about people who are citizens versus non-citizens, that's also hugely consequential. The, I'm not disputing yeah. any of that. It's just that as someone who's an immigrant, if someone told me that I'm a zero generation American or a half generation American, like I would, I would react in a very negative right. way to that, right? Because it denies me my equal standing in this country, um, right, to to others who were born here. So, uh, so this is not to say that nativity doesn't matter. Of course it does. But I think this is a way to think about all Americans as being some generation of immigrants, except for the slave descendant population, uh, the Native American population, uh, right? And then to... And then also the whatever the indigenous, formerly Mexican, formerly subjugated Spanish population right. well, uh, in the U.S. Well, I, I you exclude those. You're still talking about you know hundreds of millions of people who have some kind of immigrant uh, descendants. That's right. Here. And you know, I actually, as a native-born American, I feel the strong negative sense when I am so suddenly allied as a, a nativist or an allied with the nativist. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, <laughs> right, that's a right. little strange too. So anyway, all this, you know, all the, the definitions and the terms. Oh, okay. So one thing I was going to say about the Indian, yeah, on the Indian versus, you know, one thing I should note is, 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 is a slide to us. The census does take people as they call mm -hmm. themselves, mm -hmm. right? But what it does is when they report out the data, 
they actually translate it into their categories. And they go through this process every decade of asking experts, you know, what are the groups that we should be lumping people into? So say someone says, I am Telugu or I am Hindi speaking or I am I am Tamil, right? These are ethnicities within India. What's six, oh, right. right? Living in in California. Um, and so they collected data on on that population, is effectively the Indian origin population, uh, and then the Korean population. And then and, and don't forget the Filipinos, they were in the thirties. Oh yes, and then they and then they collected Filipinos too. You're right, absolutely right. Yeah, so basically over time uh, you know, the you got particular nationalities being added. The Census Bureau still did not report it out as an Asian category until um, until the 1980s, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? So then, you know, someone could ask, so the, what is what does it mean to be Asian? Because you have all these, yes, you have, is it a continental category? Right? That's one question I get asked all the time. And it's like, no, because if you're, if you're born in Iran, you actually, you're not counted as Asian, right? So hmm. if someone says, I'm Iranian American, Census right. Bureau says, you are white. Right. How about, uh, well, this is true with all those from the Middle East, right? Arabs and... Exactly. Are, are, are Arabs, Arabs are considered white, correct? Arabs are considered white. And so the question, so people might say, wow, that's so quaint. That's so weird. So arbitrary. Um and uh, my response is, yes, it is arbitrary, but does not mean it's uh, inconsequential. So if you think about our naturalization laws, our citizenship laws, if you were considered white, I mean, being white was the gold standard. If you could say that I'm white, mm -hmm. come right up to citizenship, right? You can you could naturalize. If you could not prove that you were white, you could not qualify for citizenship, right? So Jews could, even though Jews were treated as non-white for a while, um, even Irish for a while were not considered white. Ultimately, when push came to shove and you were talking about people who could qualify for naturalization, all of these groups qualified for citizenship. People who didn't qualify were Asians. And so, the, and so there are some famous Supreme Court cases, uh, right, of a very light-skinned Japanese-American who says, look, I'm white. I have lighter skin than some of these Eastern Europeans and Southern Europeans that you're allowing to become citizens, I should be allowed to become a U.S. citizen. Supreme Court rules and says, well, white is not about skin color. It's essentially a racial category, and it includes features like Caucasian racial features, right? It was the, it was the height of scientific racism, if you will, right? Scientific notions of race. And so, sorry, Mr. Ozawa, you, you might be light-skinned, but you're not white. And so then the next year, uh, Bhagat Singh Tin, a South Asian, says, hey, Supreme Court, you say that Caucasians are white. I'm Caucasian. You have, you have many of these reigning scientific theories of the time that says that Indians come from the Caucasoid race. So therefore, I should be eligible for citizenship. Supreme Court says, well, even if some scientific theories might say that you're Caucasian, it runs against our popular conception of who a white Caucasian is. So, sorry, you don't get citizenship either. And so that's how we get the Asian category. And we're living with that historical legacy of exclusion from citizenship. Right. But right? are Asians considered, because they, they, we have the Asian category, and, and Asians can apply for citizenship now, are, can does that mean that Asians are or can be white? <laughs> that is a, I mean, that is a loaded question, you know. And I think <laughs> it's a question where, you know, there's some, you know, I, I think depending on one's politics too, right? Some people will say, yeah, we mm -hmm. ma many Asians are assimilating in ways, um, either if you think about it in a neutral way, or maybe even in a negative way, right? Right, right. The tiger From moms. Look where all the tiger moms live. Yeah, Tiger I mean, Mazzano, but even from time immemorial, whenever an immigrant group has come into this country, they've mm -hmm. looked at the racial order, they've seen that whites have been on top, blacks on the bottom, and they've said, we do not want to be like the people at the bottom. We, we want to we be upwardly mobile, and so you see this with the Irish, you see this with the Italians, you see this with the Jews. Whenever they come in here, and it's a choice between white or black, you know, very few people 
uh, choose to ally themselves with the African-American, well, well, formerly the slave population and the African-American population, because they see that as a sign of downward mobility. I mean, of course, there's racism built into that, too. Um, but that, you know, we're living in a very different situation now where America is not just black and white. And especially if you look in states like California, you know, African-Americans are a very small portion of the population. Latinos, uh, you know, are the largest uh, racial group in California now. So what does that look like? What does it mean to be Asian in that kind of a complex world um, where whites are not the largest group? They may be the group that's the, you know, the highest in terms of socioeconomic status, in terms of being in corporate boardrooms and the entertainment industry, all of that. I don't want to minimize the, the, the power of the kind of white norm, uh, even in a, even in a state like California, but, uh, I think we're in more complicated terrain, and I think a big question moving forward is, should we be holding on to the racial categories that that you know that we had in the 1950s or 1960s? Um, and I think the, it is changing. So the Census Bureau is considering adding a Middle Eastern and North African category in uh, 2020. So that'll be a big development. Um, and, you know, there's been there's divided opinion on it, but more and more um, people who come from Middle Eastern countries are saying, yes, we want this category. Uh, because one of the questions is, you know, do we does it make it easier to target neighborhoods where a lot of Middle Easterners live? Yeah, it would make it easier to target that if someone wanted to use census data to, to inflict harm. Um, but on the flip side of it, you can also figure out what are the special needs of populations, um, you know, who are Middle Eastern and North African. That's becoming a politically and policy meaningful category now in ways that it might not have been meaningful 50 years ago. The organization I belong to, the Asian American Journalists Association, we've always embraced the Middle Eastern uh, folks, the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And well, when we had a convention in, in Detroit, uh, we were feted by uh, the, the good community in Dearborn, the Arab community mm -hmm. there, as an Asian-American community. So if they have their own community, I guess they would be split. We, they, well, they don't really consider themselves Asian-American, but, but they do sometimes. They're, they're more white, right? I mean, they, the, their, their official census category would be white. Right now, yeah. In the future, yeah. I think more and more you'll get, you'll. I mean, if that passes, and most people think it will, uh, passes meaning the Census Bureau adopts it, and no one in Congress raises a huge stink that prevents them from doing it. Um, yeah, I think, and so this will evolve over time. And you know, sometimes it is, you know, you do have. Um, this is not to say that groups won't find common cause, right? So in the future, Arab Americans may may find things in commonality with Asian Americans. Um, Although I think where we're starting to see more and more uh, happening is this emerging category of, you know, basically, uh, you know, people, there's another term that's used, which is amemsa, right? Which is Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian. A amemsa. amemsa. Arab, Middle, yeah, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, and South Asian. Wow, amemsa. Uh, which is, you know... Like leave it up to the you know I mean it's it's a it's a mouthful and it's a lot of different things packed in, but another way to think about it and I was talking to this with a colleague tongue in cheek but I almost I think I want to write an op-ed on it is these are the presumed Muslim population right these are the people that are getting beaten up that are getting shot at because they are presumed to be Muslim and or terrorist right right. Um, as as problematic and as loaded that that terminology is, we should just recognize a reality in this country in terms of, you know, some groups. For some groups, it is much safer to walk down the street than for others. Mm -hmm. And for people who are brown and presumed to be Muslim, it's like a different kind of brown than than say someone who looks Mexican. Right? Yeah. There are a different set of there are a different set of stereotypes and different set of actions that that come into play. You know, if you're brown and someone thinks that you might be Muslim, you you get a different racial experience in this country. And so that's 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 what uh, Amemsa, I think, it captures. Um, does now this Middle Eastern and North African category will capture some of that, but not entirely, because you'll have Indians who are 
South Asian and therefore under the Asian American racial label, and someone who is Iranian or or Saudi or Kuwaiti, who would presumably be captured as uh, Middle Eastern or North African, but their racial experience in the in in the U.S. may have a lot more in common than say a uh, a, a and a Bangladeshi and a uh, Japanese American. Do you think this would could possibly catch on? I mean, people are talking about it in small groups, but do you think it's necessitated by the politics of the day? You know, this is where I think so. The Census Bureau would be very hesitant, I think, to to change its uh, race reporting. Um, you know, just to suit the the uh, concerns of the day or even the concerns of the decade. But I think over time it will it is it has been sensitive to shifts over time. So I think it's the kind of thing where if in 2020 they have this Middle Eastern and North African category, in the future, if South Asians say, hey, you know what, we want to uh what the Census Bureau does is it listens to what affected communities want and if they're consistent and vocal in saying that we want a separate category, usually over time, the Census Bureau relents. So it did that with the Pacific Islander population, right? right. right? 1980, it reported it out as Asian Pacific Islander. The Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander population said, you know what, you don't lump us with Asian because we get lost in that much larger ocean there, <laughs> right? In that much larger group and our community's needs are not being addressed. And oh, by the way, we have a completely different experience being pulled into the U.S. than most Asian populations. So, you know, we're a different racial category. So the Census Bureau listened over time, and it allowed that. Yeah, but look, look at what happens of the South Asians if the Indians pull out. That's about uh, what four four million um, of the Asian American twenty one million category. Oh, yeah, if you do South Asian, it's like five. It's like five million mm. if you go South Asian. So pa Pakistanis, Bangladesh. Okay, so if you if that if they if they pull out, then the Asians suffer in terms of their num overall numbers, and you already have uh, just based on the National Asian American Survey, uh, the South Asians or the Indians who have maybe some beef with the overall umbrella, and the Filipinos are you know they're at about four million, and they they kind of feel left out. That's nine right. million out of twenty one million of this artificial political label Asian American that aren't really totally comfortable. So this is a kind of revolution that's occurring, isn't it? <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I, I think there's kind of a couple of ways to think about it. One is, you know, there are strength, there is strength in numbers, right? So I think in terms of, you know, is there such a thing as an Asian category? There's a very formal answer to that is like, yes, it exists in the Census Bureau. It's collected consistently over time. There are these check boxes that get uh, you know, it's not just in census forms, but in government forms, in in private business forms, even health forms that people fill out, right? So, yes, there is such a thing as an Asian category. Most Asians in the U.S. are immigrants who identify with their country of origin more so than the Asian category. Uh, and so that is one kind of threat to this kind of pan-Asian solidarity. Um, another threat is what we're seeing now. Right. Which is, you know, in fact, we find that Indians and Pakistanis would think of Indians and Pakistanis as Asians. It's the other groups that don't think of them as right. Asians. Right. Um, and so who has power to define who is Asian? And that, you know, what's interesting is if you, well, one of the things I find interesting is that if you go over to the UK, the default Asian category there, people presume when you say Asian that you're talking about Indians and Pakistanis. And Bangladeshis, they're not thinking Chinese, Japanese, Brits, right? Um, so there, there's some, there's the power of history, but there's also the power within the group, and that's something I think we've seen the Asian American community get better over time. But this show, our data shows, there's still a long way to go, where East Asians need to recognize that. Southeast Asians and South Asians are Asians too. In fact, you know what? If you if you combined the Southeast Asian and South Asian categories, so all of these national origins mm -hmm. together, right? They are they are the overwhelming majority. So East Asians are now a minority within the Asian American label. Mm. 
they used to be a majority, but they're they're now I think now even below if I'm remembering right, they're closer to like they're less than forty percent yeah. of the uh, and Asian yet category. the presumption by many people when you say Asian Asian American is oh that that's Chinese right you're Chinese uh, that that has been that way for for decades oh yeah you know and I mean just think of uh, yeah absolutely and think of the um you know so if you think about you know what was the you asked to start this off you know what what precipitated us asking this question you know there's been this long running debate within Asian American mm -hmm. studies. Um, in terms of you know what uh, where do South Asians fit in, right? E either in terms of where do they think of themselves, but also are they marginalized within that Asian category? You also have a, a community movement within Filipinos, right, to say yes, we're part of that group, but we're also different, right? Um, there's this there's this famous book uh, on South Asians called Apart Yet Apart, right? So, so sorry, part yet apart, right? So we're part of the Asian American community, yet we're, we're also apart. How much of that is internally generated by the South Asian population versus externally imposed by in kind of an East Asian dominant understanding of who is Asian? And so that is some, so that was one of the longstanding reasons why we did this. But looking more closely to the present, there was this video project that the New York Times put out. I don't know if you remember this. I remember that. Yeah, last year, right? Right. So this is like the this is 2016, right? And so basically, a metro editor in in the New York Times was told to go back to your country, which it was kind of you know I thought most people have been yelled that multiple times in their lives, but uh, you know this was a relatively new occurrence for for this editor, and so he wrote about it and it gained a lot of traction, and so they did a video, you know. To, of Asian Americans talking about all the times that they basically felt racialized. A couple of problems with that. I think there was one Filipino in that video, uh, and there were no South Asians, right? And especially in a city like, like basically they just grabbed whoever they could find in New York. Like you could not throw a stone in New York without hitting someone who's South Asian, right? right? Like, <laughs> like, especially the Bangladeshi population, huge in New York. Um, by the way, I do not advocate throwing stones on anyone. Um, but, you know, it's a figure. <laughs> they, they weren't hitting any cabs, that's for sure. <laughs> right, yeah. right. But, you know, one of the things someone said there, which to me shows you not only how we might think about race explicitly or even implicitly, but sometimes it just, it is so basic to our understanding. So someone says, you know, basically... Someone faced some either discrimination or microaggression, and someone made the Asian mm. eyes right. at them. Right. Right. And I was like, "What? What does that mean? Yeah. Like, do I have Asian eyes?" It's a like a World War Two, eighteen sixties kind of thing, I think. Right. I mean, it's yeah, no, but no, but but I think what the person meant is Chinese right. eyes right. or the Japanese eyes. The stereo, the, right? the uh, you know, the uh, the traditional stereotype, which. You know, we have new stereotypes. We should have, you know, which should please the racists if we recognize the new stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But that's the thing. It's like, what do we mean by Asian yeah. food? What do we mean by Asian eyes? And this to me was, it's interesting. For the first time, I went to an event in which they said, come and we will have East Asian and South mm. Asian food. And I was like, wow, yeah. that's cool. Because a lot of times, if someone says there's Asian food, I expect right. Chinese food. So yeah, he's just, so you he started bringing turmeric <laughs> to all the banquets, and <laughs> <laughs> right. so everything had that color. You know, the, not not the... <laughs> anyway. Right, right, right. So, exactly. All right, look, we've we've gone far afield from the original question, but it just shows how how rich the question is. You know, we got into talking about who's Asian, and we got into separating out. You know, the Arabs and the the Middle Easterns and the Muslim Asians mm -hmm. and this new possible group. And I guess that that speaks to the basic uh, findings from that one question about who is Asian. And and I said originally that it was jaw dropping and and it had to be jaw dropping to you, too. No, it was jaw dropping. But I've seen, you know, I have I I've seen this play out in even in some of these very progressive pan-Asian circles where, you know, people have no, told me things like, wow, you know, South right. Asians are really coming up. 
you know, like they're, you know, in fact, somebody was like, wow, mm. South Asians are taking wow, over really? these yeah. Asian yeah. spaces. And I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah. What is that? Well, <laughs> what does that mean? Everyone is used to the, the, uh, the, the very uh, monochromatic ways of their countries of origin and the, the true, I, you know, the, yeah. the idea of diversity, um, they kind of understand, but when it finally hits them in the face, you know, this is really the, this notion of Pan-Asia, which uh, I, I know when I wrote for the publication Asian Week, that was one of the ideas of that publication. And now we, I know it's hard to, to put, you know, to say, hey, this group is really Pan-Asian or that group is Pan-Asian. And they, a little, so there's some lip service to it, but I don't see anyone who's really a, an ardent Pan-Asian, this is us, unless they really like that 21 million number, right? If they, that, that's the, the right. main motivator to be Pan-Asian. So, all right. So, but one th yeah, but one thing I'll say, I do think there's progress though, right? So if you, so I, I, I see, I flip it, right? So some people saying, wow, South Asians are really coming up or Southeast Asians. I think it is when you see people, I mean, in, in, in heading up these like organizations, like, um, like, you know, that at one point, you had the the head of the White House Initiative on APIs was a South Asian woman, right, Karen Ahuja, and that and that, or I mean, I would always even say for me, one of the subtle ways I think when I go around and present in different uh, Asian American circles is to see someone who's South Asian, who's the director of the National Asian American Survey, who runs API data, who speaks with authority on the Asian American population. I think it has a subtle effect in which people recognize that there's more than one way to be Asian in this country. But you, I think you're right. It's, it's and not necessarily slapping them in the face, but to see it, right? To see the embodiment of who is Asian and to see right. our leaders and our spokespeople um, not just be East Asian, I think is important and powerful. Well, how about when President Obama in one of his last address, uh, in his last speeches to the, to the nation, he was mm -hmm. talking about the possibility of he didn't say an Asian American president, but when he was going through the litany of possibilities of who could be president, he mentioned a, a Hindu. He said, a, you know, a Hindu president, which struck me because, <laughs> you know, that was the space usually reserved for and the Asian American president, you know, but he didn't say Asian American. He said Hindu. And that was a mark of, well, <laughs> you know, Obama is one of the uh, he was he was famous for going back to California to hitting up the Indian population for money, you know, during his uh, campaigns. And uh, so it it actually didn't surprise me that he would, you know, mention them because actually, if you look at the the politicization of the community and the emerging leaders, they seem to be coming from, you know, the South Asian Indian community. No, it's a good point. Yeah, no, in, in fact, you know, yeah, I, um, if you <clears throat> have a grad student who's looking at uh, campaign contributions and their change over time, and there's been a big increase in campaign contributions among Chinese and Indian, um, Indian uh, contributors. Um, we, you know, it makes sense given the growing wealth of these populations, but they're also getting more politically active. I think part of it, I mean, Obama, it's interesting, Obama has a I wouldn't necessarily say love-hate relationship, but a love-slash-ignoring relationship with the Asian-American community, right? Like, they had to beg him and and threaten him, you know, to show up to um, to the gala, and he did it twice. I think Clinton showed up for nearly every gala that, that they held in Washington yeah. during uh, the so-called Asian Prom Week, right, during Heritage Month. But Obama, you know, first of all, he's not, mm -hmm. he doesn't do, he's not like Bill Clinton, right? He, he doesn't, he doesn't draw his energy from crowds in quite the same way. He's more of an introvert. Um, but on top of that, you know, he said this in his last, I don't know if you were there, Emil, I was there at the, at the Apex Gala in um, 2016. And, you know, he said, you know, the Asian American community needs to show up and needs to vote. Like we're, we're not going to get our voices heard if we don't show up and vote. And that was kind of like, you know, it's uh, it's kind of uh, tough love to hear that from a president, <laughs> you know, who, who, who's part of a rainbow coalition. But it's true. You know, Asian Americans, we don't vote. We don't participate in quite the same way. 
And so someone like Obama can ignore us because we're not as vocal as we should be. And and so from your research and from what what you know about the community, it's the Asian or the South Asian and the Asian Indian communities that are maybe pushing us, propelling us forward in politics. Is that you know? I, it, it's interesting because when I, you know, I came to to the U.S. in the mid '80s. I you know I, I started to get very interested in politics even back then, but I you know I really started observing Asian American politics uh, when I started doing my dissertation. So around a little bit before 2000, and what you saw then was the the legacy of of the Japanese American population, right? So you had people like Norm Mineta who were, you know, in like Senator Inoue, for example, right? These were larger than life figures. And they were, they, when you thought about Asian American politics, Japanese Americans, even though they were getting smaller and smaller as a share of the population, very powerful in Asian American politics. Um, and then I think after that, what you saw is other communities emerging. But I think you're right. I mean, what you're seeing in the last few years, and if you look at... Mm-hmm. Just this most recent election, 2016, you had a record right. number of South Asians winning office, right? So you had one senator, Kamala Harris, and four members in the House of Representatives. Um, so I think it is, and I, I hope that the Asian American community sees this as inspiring and encouraging, right? And kind of pro- propelling others to also get involved. But I also... I think it's also important for South Asians, and I think it's true, all of these South Asians who won consider themselves Asian Americans too and and are part of those circles as well. Um, So I think that's uh, moving ahead. We need to see more Filipinos running for office, more Korean Americans running for office, um, and but also donating, working in campaigns, getting more involved. Um, And uh, yeah, I mean, I, this is where I think we can learn a lot from each other. Um, and and I would say it's not just South Asians. If you look at the Hmong population, you know, they've scored an impressive set of victories for a group that is relatively small, done really well in states like Minnesota, in parts of California, in the Central Valley. Uh, so there's a lot that we can learn from each other uh, and, and inspire from each other. Okay. Now, going back to that first question about the, the survey, where... Asians weren't didn't see Indian Americans as Asian necessarily, uh, and you know we expected it from whites and from blacks and Latinos, but it was surprising that Asians didn't. All right, so now we're we're, we're talking about how we can learn from each other and how um, maybe we can change those numbers. Is that is that what the lesson or the directive is after we get the uh, you know, the, the research back that, oh, we, we have some work to do, you know, or we, you know, we, we have to start recognizing the people who, I mean, what, what I was trying to get at originally when I talked to Jennifer Lee, who was your co-author in that piece in the society pages, I was trying to get, is there a, a kind of a, a self-hatred within the Asian American community or even an Islamophobia within the Asian American community toward these populations? You know, there's, heck, there's Islamophobia even within the South Asian population, right? So you have, uh, but I don't want to overplay that because when we see, when we looked at opinion towards uh, a Muslim ban, uh, Asian Americans rejected that across the board. Um, Although South Asians had a stronger feeling in rejecting it than than others. Um, I think there's a bit of that. Uh, I think I think what we're seeing, and this is more generally true, you have a set of Asian American organizations that grew out of the civil rights movement and the decade that followed that, you know, they they are right on when it comes to the politics, right? In which like, yes, they might have been headed by Japanese Americans and then Chinese Americans, heavily East Asian oriented in their leadership. But over time, they've recognized the importance of branching out and they've tried to diversify. They're trying to do the right thing, right? Although, you know, like if you look at instances like the Oak Creek shooting, uh, this was the, the right. massacre of the in, in the Sikh temple a few years ago, or the killing right. uh, in Kansas more recently, you know, what's disheartening is that you don't, you don't see that many Chinese-American leaders or Japanese. Well, actually, I've... 
Japanese Americans, um, the JACL in particular, the Japanese American yes. Citizens League, they've been very good uh, yes. in terms of standing up against yeah. Islamophobia and other hate crimes. But, you know, other Asian groups, it's kind of, when it's a game of whack-a-mole, unfortunately, when particular parts of our communities are getting mm-hmm. whacked, other parts of our communities don't stand up nearly as much and are not nearly as vocal as we should be. So, well, well, you mentioned the Kuchibotla killing in, in that Open Society page uh, article that uh, I, I uh, mm-hmm. quoted from when um, Jennifer Lee was on uh, the program. But, mm-hmm. uh, you know, this idea of, because there's a portion of that article that talked about how you're treated differently from, from uh, Professor Lee, who is a Korean American, and how you can be seen, you mentioned this earlier in the, uh, the interview that you could be seen as a terrorist. Yeah, not just could be. I mean, ranging from you know getting pulled aside and uh, by TSA frequently in kind of in the few years after nine eleven to you know people just you know sometimes making jokes that are really not funny, but you kind of have to just just look at them and go along. When they're like you know whenever whenever I grow stubble, people are like, oh, got to be careful. I, I mean, but so is this research that you've done that is now the mirror that we have? Is it our wake up call to say, hey, uh, we did this survey. It's legit research. We're not doing so well on this as far as recognizing each other. We have to do better. Or is this just the way it is and we better gird up for worse? Or how do you see it? No, I think it, it is a it is a wake up call. I think what see what we did with this research is that we quantified something that I think a lot of people felt instinctively was true, right? Based on their experiences, especially South Asians. I mean, when we put this out there, there were people on Twitter who said, yeah, I've, I've always felt excluded. I I didn't really feel like the Asian category was for me. Right. So I just went with the South Asian category because I, I felt more at home in that category. Um, what this does, it puts numbers behind that. Right. So not only to say that, yes, it's true, but we see, I mean, we find, for example, that I think one of the things that's important here is, um, you know, some scholars say, well, Filipinos are in the same boat. Well, they're in a similar boat, but the exclusion is not nearly as strong as, as we find for South Asians. And that's, I think, important, right, to say that, hey, let's have a clear eyed understanding in terms of where the inclusion and exclusion is happening within our communities. And then let's figure out, and this I think is a tough question, but nevertheless an important one, let's figure out how do we go about fixing it. How do we go about fixing it? One is commitments by leaders within any organization that claims to be Pan-Asian needs to be as broadly and deeply representative as possible. What I mean by that is broadly is, you know, as many Asian Americans um, uh, groups as possible, you know, in terms of the programming work that they do in terms of the what they monitor, right? If you're monitoring hate crimes, you know, and you're a Pan-Asian group, right. you better be monitoring what's happening to South Asians too, right? Not just East Asians. Um, deeply, right? So it may be that you serve Asians of all stripes, but if your leadership, if your executives, if your board is heavily tilted towards East right. Asians, then you got to do something about that. Get a more diverse board, you know? Try to try to get more leaders that reflect the diversity of the community that you uh, claim to represent. Right. You know, your your article, we mentioned Kuchibotla um, a, a few seconds ago, and we're coming up. And w- one of the things that I talked about with Jennifer was that, that, that there wasn't that, you know, that that united voice of all the different groups. It was slow. Now, we, we expected to be slow from Trump. But we didn't expect it to be slow from for very many Asian American groups. Um, it was it was there ultimately, and even some South Asian groups are a little slow. But now we're coming up to a big anniversary. Well, the thirty fifth anniversary of the uh, the murder of Vincent Chin. Um, he was beaten up on June nineteenth. He died on June twenty third, and it's thirty five years. Um, is there an opportunity with this? Because a lot of people, and I, I even asked this question, is Kuchibotla the new Vincent Chin? And, you know, so I raised the question and no one answered it. <laughs> so I, I'm so glad you're raising that question, yeah. Emil. I mean, I, I think the answer is he should be. 
And the fact that he is not speaks volumes about the both implicit and explicit uh, biases that we have within our communities. I feel this, you know, I've been on different forums online and in real life where, you know, I think there's a kind of, I, I can, I get why the Vincent Chin moment is so important and so special, but I don't think we should be, see, we should see it as in an isolated way. And yeah, I mean, I think the Kuchibotla killing in Kansas is our Vincent Chin moment. I mean, this was a guy who's just having beers to in a bar that he that he goes to, uh, and who was just pulled out and shot because of, you know, the 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 kind of racism and xenophobia that's coursing through the American body politic right now. It it the parallels are unmistakable, right? But what is not parallel is the Pan Asian reaction to it, um, and so yeah, I think it's I think it's an indictment on our on our community and its politics that we we are not mobilizing in the same way. Now, someone could say, "Well, you know, that was the first time that it happened, and with each subsequent occurrence, people might get desensitized to that." So, I think there's some validity yeah. to that, well, but still, you know, we also what our data show is it, it points to another very plausible explanation, which is we have these racial biases within our community. And it's hard for someone who is who is East Asian to imagine someone who's South Asian as one of them. Right? And that that just that just limits our ability to to rise up collectively. Uh, because if we don't think of if we don't think of people like Kuchibotla, if we don't think of Sikhs who are getting beaten up you know, every year, every month in this country as one of us, that limits our ability to uh, to be strong as an Asian American community. Well, I, I have to say that I've become more sensitive to all this since moving away from the big metro areas like San Francisco and, you know, and when I started doing work in, in the Central Valley mm. where there's the Hmong and the Cambodian and, you know, I could I could look at, at the different Asian American groups and I can start to see the micro groups um, and the Vietnamese and, and then the Sikhs are very strong in, in the Stockton area. And, and so I'm sensitive, you know, Sikhs, of course, wearing the turban and the turban is, is a symbol of, you know, for some, you know, oh, turban equals terrorists. Right. And um, so more stereotypes there. Right. right. Uh, so I, I think my sensitivity to it has only come within the last 10 years as I've done more diversity reporting within the interior of California. But now I, I'm, I'm wondering about this you know, this Vincent Chin anniversary 35 years later, are you going to be doing something? I mean, is it a special day for, for, you know, the people, you know, in, in your community and the greater Asian American community, or are they planning anything? Cause I, I've heard people in the Chinese community uh, talking about doing something, but I don't know. I'm just curious right now. I, <clears throat> what's, what's interesting about this moment is I think, What's happening with Trump mm. and Jeff Sessions and immigration and a whole bunch of other issues is just so overwhelming that thinking about historical commemorations, I think, is is harder to do. And now there were, I mean, for example, there was the anniversary of the uh, Chinese Exclusion yeah. Act, right, that we just had, the uh, 135th anniversary, right, of the... Uh, Right, and, and they had the seventy fifth of the internment, right, nine oh six six. That's right. So I think you know when these moments happen, I, you know, I, 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 the answer to that question is a complicated one because right now I think the Asian American community, as I see it, is in a bit is in disarray right now. It's still trying to figure out, short of resistance, which a lot of community groups are doing. It's to just right. figure out kind of what, how are we making sense both of our history and of our present moment, right. and to and to figure this stuff out. Um, so you know, it's it's a, and I think that'll be part of. I really like the way, at least implicitly, that you're bringing this up is to say, listen, this is not just history; it's happening right now, right? And so let's make those connections, right? Let's make the connection between the past and the present. Yeah. Right. 
Well, it's important, too, because, I mean, I, speaking as a journalist, Journalists, we always go to history when we, you know, are desperately in need for a news story for our editors, right? And so we we lean on the history, but the history is important because right. we didn't learn it the first time, right? Or we didn't we didn't commit it to memory, right. yep. and so it needs to be, you know, it needs to come up again, and it's helpful because then people begin to see the connections and they. And then maybe they have that moment that that spurs them to the action that that they should be taking. But uh, you know, it's it's very. I was I was I was uh, very surprised when Kuchibola did not, you know, have that moment. You know, you know, across the board, you know, of inspiring others to speak out to say stop. But. Uh, as you say, mm -hmm. this is a moment when, you know, in this, in this Trump era where there are so many fronts. And uh, I think we are looking for leaders now. We're looking for people who can maybe make sense of the disarray. Karthik, uh, yeah. thank you very yeah. much for your research. And thank you very much for coming on Emil Amuck's Takeout. And I hope you can be uh, become a regular uh, comer honor on the program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, this is... This is fun, and as uh, I'm, I like the wide, ra wide ranging nature of our conversation here, because I think there's a just in in many ways it kind of is an entree into each of these each of the topics we talked about it could take an entire episode or even an entire month. But I'm happy happy to be on here with you, and also thank you for your long standing service to the community in terms of getting us to think critically about these issues. Well, I, I thank you for that. Um, you know, this is the thing about podcasting. It sort of allows us to talk about these things where we might get a soundbite on mainstream broadcasting or on cable casting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're always looking for a, um, you know, that, that place at the table, but we have this, this technology now where we can have the table anytime we want on demand, 24 hours. And uh, yeah. so I thank you for participating today. Yeah. My pleasure. Karthik. Ramakrishnan of AAPI Data. And now my essay for Father's Day, as published in my book, Amok, Essays from an Asian American Perspective, which was published by Asian Week and won an American Book Award back in 2000, which I'm very thankful to the Before Columbus Foundation. But this is the essay. I read it because I have done iterations of this on the ALDEF blog over the years. And um, I'm going to read this unadorned. I mean, I know that there are some things that I wrote that uh, I changed. Uh, but this is about as close as it got to the original NPR essay, which I read in 19... I think I wrote that in 1991. And this, in the book, was written in 1995. So, here it is. It was called Father's Game, Learning the Score with Dad. I'm coming up to my seventh Father's Day. I can tell by the number of coffee mugs I own that say, World's Greatest Dad. These are not Pulitzer Prizes. They aren't even World Cups. But considering the awards committee, my three kids, the mugs are more satisfying. My daughter chooses mugs, but perhaps yours is into ties or socks, putters or chainsaws. Uh, whatever the award medium, we dads must accept all items graciously. I, however, know just how unworthy I am. I still feel like a stand-in on Father's Day. For the seventh straight year, the mug might say, world's greatest dad. But deep down, I know I'm still just rookie of the year. For me, Father's Day will never be absolutely mine. It will still belong to my dad. If you're the Americanized son of an Asian immigrant, you know what that means. We still owe them for all the lost father's days. My dad spoke Ilocano. This is what Marco spoke, but without the power. He spoke English too, but I spoke it better. It made our relationship a quiet one. The only time we really connected was when watching baseball. He had an immigrant's passion for the game. It symbolized America with its anthem and heroism, and it was a patient game. 
The language of balls and strikes was easy. The math even simpler. Three strikes, four balls, three outs, nine innings. My dad was many innings older than me. 50 years worth. I remember when he taught me how to play. He brought me out to San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, the Panhandle, an appropriate name, I thought, for a fry cook and his son to learn to play ball. It was a simple lesson. He handed me the bat and threw the ball at me. He wasn't a great teacher, but that's when he knew to call in tutors. We go to Candlestick and sit in the grandstands to see Willie Mays, with whom my father shared a first name, if not his statistics. Baseball gave us a context. What's the score? One of us would always ask. One of us would always know. We followed the score. We had a stake in the team and in each other. But of course, there were seasons when not even baseball would save us. Before I was out of junior high school, my father had retired, and I was going to father and son events alone. He was old. By age 12, I was an ageist. We kept drifting apart, our lives as patterned as a baseball diamond. He was the first baseline, I was the third baseline. A field apart, connected only at home. But then I went to college on the East Coast. Though I majored in alienation, I took a few courses where I learned a little about the hardship and racism endured by Filipino immigrants in the 20s. I learned about the links between the exclusion laws and the general anti-Asian sentiment at the time that were codified by such things as the anti-miscegenation laws. I never quite understood why my father, after coming to America in 1928, lived a bachelor's life until the 50s. I had thought it was by choice, preference, inability, or for lack of social skills. I thought it might have something to do with his penchant for loud ties. It never dawned on me that he stood out like a loud tie. It was more than just fate. It was society. History taught me that, and through it, I found a clear path to my father. It was a little late, but it set up our ninth inning perfectly. On the Wednesday before Father's Day, 1978, we did a day game. My treat. We were a striking pair. I was wearing a jacket and tie, so we got a discount saying I was a businessman. Uh, He was in a giant's cap and running shoes and acting like a rascal, cutting in line, running about, me in tow. I had to apologize to the ticket person as I paid for our seats. They cost a buck fifty to sit in left field then. But the little guy wanted to sit closer, so we snuck down past the guard and wound up in prime third base territory. During the game, we enjoyed our passion quietly. Fancying myself a broadcaster, I was doing play-by-play in my head. Every now and then, I would turn to Dad for a little color. He was involved with the drama himself, in between bites of his homemade adobo sandwich, vinegary pork butts on white bread, tastier than a ballpark frank. The Giants celebrated our outing with a fine performance. They fought back to take the lead from the Phillies, and then it was up to Vita Blue to mow them down to the bottom of the ninth. Blue, no longer in his prime and written off by many as an old man in his thirties, struck out both Luzinski and Schmidt, the heart of the order to end the game. We stood and yelled together in wild appreciation, which led to our only real conversation of the day. Would the Giants get through June and go all the way? Uh, My dad was willing to take a psychic flyer on that one. They'll go all the way now, he said. As it was, the Giants didn't. And two hours later, back home, after he saw the future and the highlights on the local news, my father died on that Wednesday before Father's Day. Hardening of the arteries, the doctor said. But deep in my heart, I knew it was pennant fever. My uh, Father's Day essay, I wrote it, first wrote it June 14th, 19, oh, it must have been 1990. Um, And in fact, every time June 14th rolls around, it is a special day. It's a flag day. It's uh, the day my father died. And not to complicate things too much, it's also Donald Trump's birthday but I won't let it spoil it. And that's our program. Hey, we're on iTunes. Please subscribe, rate, and review. Tell your friends about the show. Share a link. You can contact me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or go to the Aldef blog at 
www.aaldef.org slash blog. Give us your feedback on www.amok.com. I know that's a lot of places you can go, but... Uh, you know, I'm a multi-platform guy. www.amok.com. You can find out about my show, where to get tickets. You can even leave a message on SpeakPipe. You don't even need a phone. And uh, if you got something to say, we might just use it, just like on talk radio. Also, check me out on Inquirer.net, uh, the Philippines' uh, number one daily. If you like what we do, share the link at www.aldef.org slash blog and share the link here to the podcast go to the aldef blog hit the donate button if you're so moved remember that aldef the asian american legal defense and education fund is a 501c3 and your help is tax deductible once again thanks for listening to the dry version no music hey look it's just just me me and the and the good microphone and no mixer me Thanks for listening to Emil Amok's Takeout. I'm Emil Guillermo. Mm-hmm.